Hey guys, Spencer here. Today, we're going to be going over a hierarchical clustering. This is an alternative to the k-means clustering algorithm, and there is definitely a pro as well as a con to using this type of unsupervised learning technique uh, versus the former k-means clustering. So, let's get down to it. I created a short deck that basically summarizes the back end on how to use hierarchical clustering and then the relative pros and cons on using this particular unsupervised learning algorithm. So what is hierarchical clustering? It's an alternative to the k-means clustering algorithm. It essentially does the same thing, well, the net result where you, well, this algorithm groups together observations into the same group. Now it does this via a variety of ways, but at the very high level, uh, it will typically formulate the number of clusters, either top to bottom or bottom to top. I'll go a little bit deeper into that further into this deck. Uh, you can also specify what type of distance metrics you can particularly use. Uh, compared to the k-means where everything is this Euclidean, you can use different distance metrics within this particular method. So there are different types of hierarchical clustering. The first is the agglomer agglomerative or agnes. This is the bottom-up approach. So essentially think of where each observation within your data set is its own cluster. Now, uh, each of these observations within the cluster will start to merge together. It will continue to do this until all of the observations are in this one huge group. But when we start from the bottom, now we end up at the very top. Uh, during the transition period where all of our observations are being clumped up into one, there's many, many groups that are being grouped up as they go up to just be one huge, gigantic uh, cluster. That is essentially the Agnes approach. The other approach is basically the opposite. It's the divisive hierarchical clustering, where you're essentially going from top to bottom. So think in terms of where we have all of our observations, everything starts off as one cluster. Now then, it'll start to branch off. So as the number of observations start to decrease, it'll think of it as a tree, where you have two branches or however many branches there are that are branching off. You are splitting each individual uh, observation into its own cluster. So you're, you're going to get miniature groups, and then from those miniature groups, you're going to get even smaller groups. You can, be, you can keep on doing that until we just have one observation left within each of those clusters. So those are the different forms of the hierarchical clustering. Now, going back to the distance, uh, whereas the k-means has a typical Euclidean distance, for this particular method, you can use a variety of distance metrics. You can use the Manhattan distance, you can use the same Euclidean distance as the k-means, you can use maximum distance, averages, medians, you name it. Um, it. It essentially uses any type of distance flavor. And there is definitely a pro to that. Now, one thing that's uh, unique about this particular method is its linking. There are many different types of linkages uh, on how to combine different clusters together. One of these is, and I'll be doing this in our tutorial later down this video, but one of these is the complete linkage of clustering. It essentially obtains all the distances between all of the observations of cluster one and cluster two, and it basically combines them together if they are close, closer to each other than the other um, cluster. And it'll keep on doing this until you run out of space, essentially. And then there's a variety of other forms. One of them is the average linkage clustering. The other one is centroid. Um, you can read the, uh, the details over here, but they all essentially do the same thing, sort of, on, but they the way that they come up with deriving the centroids are a little bit different and calculating which distances to compute and which ones to actually take into consideration. Now, if you've seen my previous video on what k-means clustering is, then continue on. But if you haven't already, I encourage you to watch it. But it is essentially, we're, I'm essentially going to be using the same package uh, to actually go through the hierarchical clustering as that of the k-means clustering. I'm going to be using the facto extra package over here. And I will be using the iris data set as well.
The Iris data set is essentially a built-in data set with an R. Uh, has 150 observations and it's about flowers. It gives you the set ball lengths, the widths, and then petal length, petal width. Um, all the botanists can explain what those are, but they are essentially measurements of these specific flowers that we have over here. Now, the overall goal is to do a clustering algorithm, the hierarchical clustering algorithm on these observations or these features right here. And we will essentially compare the species to our uh, type of clusters that we have generated via the method. Cool. All right. So without further ado, let's get down to the algorithm. First things first, what I want to do, I just want to get the labels over here. And this is similar to what I have done in the previous video for the k-means clustering. Uh, but I will get the species. I'll make sure I save that over here. Uh, let's take a look at this. The, this iris data set is essentially a very balanced data set. We also, ha we also have three uh, different groups that we can take a look at as well. Uh, that we will actually be taking into consideration. So first things first, uh, as always, we want to make sure we scale our data so that our distance algorithm can actually do what it's intended to do. And it's not messing around with unbalanced data within our hyperspace or our dimensional space. And the easiest way to do this is just to call the scale function. So, oh wait, first I want to call, let's get the data over here. Um, I will essentially just call iris data as you go to iris. One four, get all that data, and then the iris data. I'll just call this standardized. Uh, I'll scale that with the iris data over here, and so this should just be the first four columns with standardized values. That looks pretty good. It also gives you the center and the scale associated with that. Now we will also be using the distance function. Uh, this distance function is built into the facto extra, and real quick on this. Uh, let's do that one. Yeah, the uh, the default here is Euclidean distance method, uh, but you can also use the Manhattan, Kendall, Spearman, Canberra, etc. Uh, it's basically whatever you would want to do. But for the purpose of this video, I'll be using the Euclidean distance. So over here, the iris dot distance or dist. That is equal to the distance of your iris data standard. So that looks something like this over here. Cool. And also in the previous video, we had something similar, actually the exact same. Uh, we have this type of uh, the distance metrics within our data. And you can take a little bit of a further look as to how they calculate the Euclidean distance. It's essentially an algorithm like an equation you just plug in your inputs and then you get an output <laughs> now one of the really neat things about hierarchical clustering is that compared to k-means clustering where you have to predefine the number of clusters that you would have to do within the algorithm for this particular method hierarchical clustering you do not have to identify however many clusters since we are either doing the top down or bottom up approach we don't really need to identify what type of or however many clusters we need to use. So we can actually just get straight to the algorithm. So hierarchical, hierarchical clustering algorithm. Okay. And then there's a really, really neat function that you can just use over here. And I'll just call this uh, hierarchical clustering output and then iris over here, H clust over here. And then you'd be passing in your distance over here, which is essentially your standardized data and uh, you did the Euclidean distance of that standardized data. And then for your second input, uh, you just want to put in the type of method you have and for more instructions on what potential methods you can use, you can use complete, uh, the average, whatever that is, median, centroid. So it's essentially the type of method to utilize when you want to figure out how to merge uh, clusters with each other. And I explained this a little bit more in the PowerPoint, which I did earlier. Uh, so we'll just be do, using the complete method over here. And then let's take a look at that, at the outputs. So this is what we have. We have 150 observations. It even labels what type of distance we are using and also the clustering method. Cool. Now let's take a look at the dendrogram. Dendrogram, sorry. <laughs> dendrogram. 
So we'll just be plotting this um, plot of the of our output, and we should have the dendrogram over here. And a really neat way to sort of like visualize this, we we'll just do a rectangle of your H cluster over here in hc dot out iris and then you can specify the number of clusters that we want to do in this case it will be three since we only have three um your uh, unique uh, iris and species uh, so you, this, where k is the number of clusters uh, we have three attributes that ideally we want to have three cl clusters to match up with um, so ideally we would have three, but we can always play around with that number. I'm in a border just for coloring purposes. Let's do two to five over here. Over here. So essentially what this den diagram does is that it provides, and I think this method is the agglomerative. It's a bottom down approach. Uh, yeah, excuse me. This is a bottom up approach. So essentially each of our observations are essentially being merged as they go up and up and up until everything is under one group. Now the really cool thing about using the hierarchical clustering method is that we have a really neat tree observation to determine which type or however many types of clusters that we might want to utilize. As you can see here, uh, since I chose k is equal to 3 for 3 clusters, it's essentially drawing a line between counting the number of edges that occur. So see this line right here? There are three lines that are being intersected at the very same root level. Hence, we will have three different types of uh, groups that are created here. Now, if you wanted, let's see, one, two, three, four, five groups, if we wanted five, we'll be drawing a line over here. And with these new intersected areas that we have going on over here, for each intersection, this is its own, it's going to be its own cluster. So if we wanted to say k is equal to 5 for demonstration purposes, uh, if we wanted it to be 5, uh, actually let's plot that again and plot. If we want it to be 5, we'll be doing, yeah, we'll just draw a line through 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 specific areas and it'll essentially just group together the different types of clusters that we might generate. Also, I might need to change that color since we have an additional, yeah, since we have an additional group that we want to cluster. So that's a purplish instead of a red. So that's how the dendro dendrograms really work. Uh, it's a really, really great tool. Uh, there are some drawbacks, like if we have like a billion observations, then obviously using this type of method is not really going to cut it. Um, uh, because there's like so much data. So that's where we would probably use a k-means instead of a, a hierarchical clustering. But I digress. Alright, so let's revert this back to three groups because we know that there are three groups that we want to merge this back onto because we have the Virginica, the Setosas, and the... Oh my gosh, what was it called? Uh, the third one. Um... This is driving me nuts. The Versicolor, that's what it is. Yeah, since we have three groups, we want to merge back. We want to merge, not merge, we want to create clusters, three clusters to potentially identify what those labels already are. Because if we have data that's incoming and does not have a later label, then we could theoretically label that data. And we might have some margin of error as well. Well, we will have a margin of error if we were to do that. Okay, cool. So let's count the clusters, clusters over right here. So iris.clusters, qtree, this is a really neat function. Uh, we have to pass in the hierarchical clustering over here, and k is equal to 3. So I'll just do the question mark on qtree. So this is a really, really cool uh, method where going back to the dendrogram where we can identify visually where to do the cut and identify which observations are related to which type of group this will actually cut your group into that specific cluster of data and it's really cool really sweet now that we have our clusters let's take a look at that this is according to the number of observations there should be like 150 here uh, should be length 
He has 150 of these, and for each of these observations, 1 through 150, it has this associated cluster number. Now let's visualize visualize the cluster. If I can spell that right, I'll just do fizz. Uh, visualize the cluster and how well it did. Uh, one thing that we want to do before we actually even visualize this, uh, once we have our iris data standardized over here, we want to get the row names, we want to associate that with the uh, iris data. Well, iris on species, we want to paste this with the value, well, also we want to separate. So this could be a separate function, underscore, and it's be one through dimension of iris. The iris and call the number of rows and separate that out. So that should be good right here. So we have our iris data standardized with its unique row name identifiers over here. Sweet, now that we have the visualizations of our cluster components created, we're gonna be using a very specific function from the Facto Extra library, where essentially we are now gonna be visualizing using the fviz cluster. Uh, it's a really great algorithm on how to plot stuff. So we're just gonna be doing the list data is equal to our iris data standard. Uh, and cluster is equal to our iris clusters here. So this is what it looks like utilizing the hierarchical clustering algorithm here. Let's take a look at that. So, oh uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, compared to our uh, previous video in the hierarchical clustering, we had a slightly different looking uh, slice on what, what type of uh, data is going to be associated with a different type of cluster. So I find that very interesting. But from a nutshell, this is hierarchical clustering. Uh, we essentially have all of our unlabeled data that's being pushed in. And since we already know what each observation is already labeled, we could correctly identify or just observe what type of observations have been correctly associated with each other. So it looks like some setosas are actually inside the versicolors for this particular observation over here. Um, so that's an outlier for this. It looks like we got the majority of cetosis. And this middle ground looks like a mess uh, between virginicas and versicolors. Last but not least, let's actually just do like a table real quick on the iris on the species and let's get the iris of the clusters. Clusters. So it looks, yeah, I missed that one Satosa for that one particular group located here. Oh, wow, yeah, I mischaracterized um, a good chunk of the Versicolors and for the Virginicas, it got a good chunk of those observations in group three. So it looks like the Versicolors, if we had additional data, we could potentially get this to a very low uh, rate of error. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video as much as I did on hierarchical clustering. It's a great algorithm to use and a great alternative to k-means clustering, especially if we want to visualize what is going on and what type of data are being combined. So please leave a like, make sure you subscribe with the notifications on, and without further ado, I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you for watching. <laughs>